Welcome back, everybody. Um, I really love speaking to people who are so ingrained and so passionate about the world of acting. Uh, it's it's just it's a different feeling speaking to people like that. And uh, and our next guest certainly falls into that category. Uh, I wanted to welcome to the show actress, director, producer Lorraine Rodriguez Reyes. Welcome, Lorraine. Hi. Thank you for having me, Alan. It's it's certainly uh, a pleasure of mine. Now, my uh, assistant, uh, Nalika, is a huge Legacies fan. She loves it. Uh, so <laughs> she obviously remembers you. As a matter of fact, you were the first person that she wanted to invite. So, really? uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, she, uh, you know, so let's let's quench her thirst right off the bat by by starting with Legacies. So, Nalika, we're, we're here. We're with you. So, um, Lorraine. In terms of uh, in terms of legacies, you know, it's it's a great CW uh, series. I think it's uh, three seasons now, but mm -hmm. you actually started it kind of because you were in the first uh, season in the first episode, so you got things kicked off, and then you came back for episode nine. Um, how did that project come about, and uh, what uh, what did you like, or uh, the whole process? Well, what did you think about it? Well, it was really exciting. Um, it's funny because I was actually booked out um okay. on vacation okay. and my agents reached out and they said you know i know you're not in town but is there any way you can put yourself on tape okay and it's fourth of july weekend and it's like what how who am i going to find to put me on tape but i found someone <laughs> and it was just that knowing feeling where you read the sides and you're going oh my gosh this is like fabulous this is perfect like i can book this and i went in and i read for it and then when i came back from vacation i had a call back Okay. And that was really exciting, you know, especially here in Atlanta, you know, a lot of work is booked off a of tape mm -hmm. versus when I was in New York. Well, now in COVID, it's all changed. But <laughs> before COVID, it was, um, you know, you go in in person, you see the producers, you go in one for the casting director, then you go in for producers, and it's always this energy in the room. So doing it on tape is a little, like, challenging sometimes because I can't feel you. <laughs> and if we're vibing. Um, so I went in in person, and it was fun. Um, I loved it. I loved being on the lot. And then they gave me a call and they said, you booked the role, which was very exciting. Awesome. It was a night shoot in a church. Um, and the fact that my foster child is one of the main characters. Um, it was amazing to see the special effects on yeah. how a wolf comes about. Yeah. I was in awe. I, I, I felt like this was a learning experience, not only for the acting part, but just the the graphics the 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 sci-fi appeal to it the the makeup yeah. the artistry um so for me it was amazing and i love all that stuff so it was just even you know it it, it was like the cherry on top <laughs> perfect and um it's it's shot in atlanta so uh i i know you're a new yorker uh, uh when did you move to atlanta and did it have anything to do with legacies no i moved to atlanta seven years ago um okay because my husband was relocated for work. So we had that, that moment of like, he said, you know, you can we, can, we can stay in New York and I won't go for work, but who am I to stifle your dreams, right? You support mine all my life, like well, all our marriage and our relationship, I can't stifle yours. So I told him, I said, you know what, let's go. The kids are little, it's a good time to transition. If it doesn't work out, you can always come back. Yeah. And now we, we love Atlanta. We, I say committed because we bought a house here. The kids are already in school here. Um, and I was blessed because when I moved here, I was still working in New York. I was still doing What Will You Do on yeah. ABC. And I was also working as a producer, which was my, um, most people go into being a server. I was a horrible server, um, bartender, et cetera. Um, I ended up producing as like my, my day gig. Yep. <laughs> Um, and so I was still producing in New York and I was flying back and forth for a bit. Um, but I signed with AMT here and they've been marvelous, fabulous. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Atlanta just became home and I started getting used to self tapes and you, you start creating a little nucleus. It's not the same as New York where it's like, I would run into you at auditions, Alan, and say hi, and we can have coffee here. Yeah. It's kind of, you really don't run into anybody. And if you do go in, in person for some, it's, you know, there isn't that camaraderie of like, I know everyone, but I understand that that's my experience because I'm a mom. So I'm not out there in the evenings networking. It's like my evenings are tucking in babies. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, well, I mean, Atlanta, Atlanta has a ton of projects. You know, Tyler Perry, who you've got a chance to work with, uh, has his own uh, studio there. So Atlanta is a wonderful community. Uh, I know a number of actors uh, who moved to Atlanta, you know, to be a part of that community and kind of, um, I mean, I, technically it is still a secondary market, but uh, it's it's that 1A, you know, where, you know, New York and LA and then you have Atlanta. So I think it's it's a great place to be. And I'm in 1B or 1C in Chicago. It's it's we're we're, <clears throat> we're growing, but we're, we're not at the place where Atlanta uh, is at the moment. So wonderful theater district. Yeah, and we'll talk about it because you you actually did uh, did something at uh, at one of the theaters here. Um, at least no, not uh, in Chicago. But you did okay. So uh, correct me then. I know that you were at Looking Glass uh, Theater. Looking Glass is in Chicago. That's New York. There's a so, New York Looking Glass. There's a New York Looking Glass. Got it. Okay, so I got that part uh, that part up. I um, wish it was in Chicago. <laughs> So that question will cross uh, will cross off, but we'll come back to uh, to what we were talking about. Um, last thing on legacies, and I know you didn't really get a chance to work with her, but Danielle, uh, who's on that show, I I fell in love with her in uh, in Aloha uh, when she had the scene when she was uh, you know uh, the daughter and that basically scene that has no words in it uh, with Bradley Cooper, where you know both of them understand that. He knows that uh, she's his daughter and she knows that he's her dad. And just seeing the emotion on her face, I, I completely, yeah. Every time I watch that movie, I break down and I, and I cry during it. So I've, I've been following Danielle ever since then because I think she's wonderful. So I'm glad for all the successes that she's having with Legacies. Yes, yeah. very much so. Um, all right, so let's, let's kind of, uh, you know, pull it back uh, because, you know, I know, uh, I know, you know, you've done a ton of stage. You've done, you know, a ton of uh, a ton of um, on-screen work. But how did it all start? I know you got your BA from SUNY, uh, but I don't know. Was the BA in acting? I didn't think it was. It was in theater. So I have a BA in theater arts with a a minor in Spanish. Got it. From SUNY New Paltz. So it started when I was um, sixteen. Okay. An after school program called Mind Builders in New York, All right. uh, in the Bronx. And they had, I, I went there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I believe it was, or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday after school, literally from like 4 30 to 8 30. And okay. we would do music, dance, acting. It was a free program. They had a grant, but you had to audition for it. And so I spent most of my um, junior year and senior year there. And it was the program director, Melveda Hughes, who mm -hmm. said to me, I think you should audition and go to college mm -hmm. and make that your major. And I thought, oh, well, I'm, I promised my mom I'll do poli sci. <laughs> I'm yeah. gonna be an attorney. <laughs> and she's like, no, 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 try and audition. And so they helped me with my auditions. And with them, I did my first off-Broadway play while doing in new york they have an exam called regents exams mm -hmm. where it's like these tedious exams that you have to take to graduate for an academic diploma and so i was doing tech week taking regents trying to graduate high school all at the same time and i loved every minute of it okay. so it, i guess it was in my in my blood in my dna yeah so how did mom take you not being a poli sci and go to theater instead I think she was okay with it because she, we made a deal that I wouldn't go to a conservatory. Okay. So the deal was you can do that, but you can't go to a conservatory. You have to be well-rounded. I want you to learn about other things just in case you change your mind. Mm -hmm. um, so we, I received a scholarship for Marymount Manhattan, but they wanted me to commute. And that was not an option for me. <laughs> you know, it's like you want the college experience. And so I ended up going to SUNY New Paltz and they had a wonderful theater department, very theater heavy. There wasn't really any TV and film. Mm -hmm. That came after graduation when I started taking classes at Actors Connection and one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Um, so that's where I started. And then I gave myself four years to kind of figure it out if this is what I want. And I tried, Alan, to dissect it out of me. Okay. I, mean, I really did, to be honest with you, just because it's like, I need income. I want to be financially secure. 
I couldn't land an agent in the beginning. Um, my accent was very thick. It was a very New York Bronx Latina mm -hmm. accent. Yeah. Um, so the agents didn't really know what to do with me. And at that point being Latina wasn't cool. You know, JLo, I think was just starting to come out. We didn't have Beyonce. We didn't, you know, it, it was just a very homogenous kind of role. And so the only Latinas that I had who were fabulous was Rosie Perez, Lauren yeah. Velez. Um, great. But you saw how Hollywood pigeonholed yeah. them yeah. in certain roles. Whereas yeah. now, let's just put it this way. I've seen the growth from my auditions from being the prostitute, mm -hmm. the baby mama, to now yeah. surgeons and doctors and attorneys and detectives. Good. So you see the growth in the industry. Good. Um, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, no, it's, and, and so I, once I gave myself the four years, Mm -hmm. and had the, like five jobs and was really hustling and hitting the pavement with backstage and the auditions. And it was great. I wouldn't yeah. change for the world. I decided to apply to ART and Yale. And then I made my mom a deal that if I didn't get into ART or Yale for an MFA, then I would do one in producing because Columbia offered a producing program with an yeah. MBA. So we had a plan. Yeah. I was going to be in the arts no matter what. <laughs> Yeah, and that that brings us to uh, to kind of our Russian connection, uh, which I didn't expect when I first started uh, kind of doing my prep on you. Is uh, you went to your MFA at Harvard, uh, you got accepted there, and the is is explain that to me because where where is that whole Moscow connection and Harvard? Where does that come into play? I, I don't uh, quite understand. It's the Mahat Moscow Art Theater School, okay. um, and. It was a marriage between the American Repertory Theater at Harvard, mm -hmm. which was started by Bob Runstein. He came from Yale. I guess they had some kind of, you know, it's like yeah. football competition, et cetera. Yeah. Um, not quite sure of the drama behind it, but I'm just happy that he started it. And so they started the American Repertory Theater at Harvard, and they started the uh, offering the MFA conjunction with the Mahat so that mm -hmm. we were able to study abroad in yeah. Russia. So they brought Russian teachers over in the summer. Our, our our semester started in July okay. because it's like a two and a half year program, yeah. but it's long. We didn't really have any breaks. It was a professional theater program. So you, you work Tuesday through Sunday. We were in classes. Um, I loved it. I mm -hmm. loved, I loved working with the Russians. It was for me, if I had my way, I would have stayed longer and worked with them longer because I felt I grew the most as an actress. Um, like I had one teacher, Roman, may he rest in peace. And we were doing a scene and they had us reading all of Dostoevsky's novels because he wanted to select scenes from it because of the way it's written, it's like a dialogue. Yeah. And we had to then perform it. And they called it like an evening of Dostoevsky. And I remember he gave me a character with, with an impediment. And mm -hmm. I was pissed off. Like, it's like, why? Why can't I be the heroine? And it's like, you're not her, that's not you. <laughs> <laughs> in their eyes. And I remember I did the scene and he turned around and he went, Niet! Niet! Ochim Bloha! <laughs> and I just looked at him. No American teachers ever talked to us like that. Yeah. And he said, he used to call me Renuchka. And he said, Renuchka, I tell you this because I know you can do better. That was shit in a very thick Russian accent. And it's like, okay, okay, I get it. Um, so they really pushed your limits. And, um, so we had them in July, we had rhythm, acting, um, movement. Yep. So, and then we had language class, language immersion. So is it where they were teaching you general phrases like Skolka, uh, you know, Dobrutra, Kandila, just kind of to, to be able to survive through Moscow. Yep. Um, and it was just magical. And then going to Moscow was a little bit of a transition for me. Um, you know, the same, the same way I used to get followed in stores in the US because I'm Latina is the same way I got followed in Russia because they thought I was Chechnyan. Really? Yes, I got that all the time. They thought I was Chechnyan. I could not believe it. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> but, okay. Um, but sitting in Manhattan and being able to sit in a chair and say, oh my gosh, Stanislavski sat in this chair. Like they performed the seagull here. It was magical. Um, the work was vigorous. There wasn't time. Like if I thought that I was going to vacation in Russia and go see things and 
do you know? I tried to convince the director to let me stay in Russia a month after, mm -hmm. um, just so I can travel. Um, they gave us um, a student tandem, which they called Angels. Mm -hmm. And it was the students who were learning how to be producers because they had a producing segment. So they were working on, um, they were working on their English. So they were our translators and they would take us everywhere. Um, but it was, it's like an onion, you know? They were very tough on the exterior, but when you peel it back, the most genteel, beautiful, I'm still friends with people from, from that program um, in Russia. One is a dear friend of mine. And just to be able to distill and take all the BS out so that you can bring out your talent. And then the love and the passion for the arts for me was, it wasn't about bottom line, it was about the experience. Yeah, Russian teachers um, in general, Russian teachers, Russian coaches. You know, my my uh, kids are going through that uh, that right now. My daughter took gymnastics, uh, the rhythmic gymnastics, and uh, Russian coaches who are going to stretch you beyond your limits. She's like, oh, I'd rather be me to be. Me. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember when I did fencing in Russia, and my my coach was running literally with uh, with a foil and hitting me on my butt to make sure that I would uh, that I would run faster. Russian coaches are a little different. So I, I actually was really interested to hear kind of how, you know, uh, the American uh, theater education versus the Russian theater education. Those must have been very, very different. I'm glad you got into that. Oh, no, they, they are. It's even at, at Harvard. I remember when we would get critiques, it was very much, we start with the positive. Yes. And then we'll work our way with, you can, you can try, you know, I would like to see more of, it, it was a very, very curated yeah. <laughs> critique whereas with with my russian professors and there was no, no. <laughs> yeah it's 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 direct it's to the point and uh, they're gonna acknowledge all of your negatives and if they don't say anything then that's a positive and you should be thankful for it mm -hmm. yeah. uh very cool but listen you, you you had such an incredible experience uh it it really uh elevated uh you as an actor and as a person and such uh, such cool thing that now you can bring to any performance. I, I really, really respect uh, the fact that you went through it and uh, stuck with it. Thank you, thank you. All right, um, so you, uh, again, you kind of uh, done a lot of stage and uh, you've, you've done a lot of stage. Uh, you actually had a collaboration with, with an excellent uh, director who's, who's hired you for four of your of your performances uh, all over New York. I thought one of them was in Chicago at the Looking Glass, but it was in New York. Uh, but at Cherry Lane, at Looking Glass, and some of the other ones, uh, this is Francisco uh, Solorzano. Now, yes. um, it's is it you know what it seems like on paper that uh, you worked uh, the first time and he really appreciated your work and kind of kept bringing you back, or was it a coincidence that uh, you ended up working with him in four times? Uh, no, he kept bringing me back. The first time we yeah. had. Um... We did the donde, which is interesting yeah. because it's a it's a very uh, prevalent play for the times we're in now as well. Yeah. Um, and we worked together, and it was right after 9/11 that yeah. that he held the auditions for it. Which you know, again, it's I just feel like you know it's all part of history, and yeah. theater is a reflection of society. Yeah. Um, and then he had another project and he called me on and that collaboration just kept happening. And then he invited me to become part of their theater group called Barefoot Theater Company. Yeah. And um, it's been a wonderful home, a creative home where, you know, we've read scripts for folks, they've done readings. I was able to collaborate with them in Easter Productions. I brought them together um, mm -hmm. because Easter was one of the production companies I worked for. Mm -hmm. and they just make the art fun it's about the love of it um and collaborating as a true ensemble a true like when i'm telling you alan it's like and we're gonna help paint and we're gonna do this and we're gonna bring in <laughs> um and working with frank has been a blessing i uh he also does film now as well so it's it's become like barefoot theater and then barefoot film yep. um so it, it's been a true pleasure and whenever we can collaborate it's like yay <laughs> that's that's wonderful um those are the types of collaborations that that i look for and i enjoy you know i kind of uh 
ran into one with uh, with a student director when I auditioned for a tiny part. Uh, he ended up uh, rewriting the whole thing and making me a lead in it, and right. then he kept bringing me back and writing parts up for me. So yeah, it's it's just it's an amazing experience. I, I so so enjoy it. I, I'm sure you did as well with Frank. Um, okay. Let's uh, let's talk about your uh, you know one woman play the uh, mommy confessions. You uh, you had your you know kind of your first uh, child and this brought on uh, uh, or inspired you to do this show and you went out and you interviewed uh, other women and then you kind of put everything together in a play. Tell us more about it. Well, um, when I was pregnant with my first child, um, mm -hmm. it was a glorious pregnancy. I, when I tell you, Alan, it was, I worked to the day I gave birth. I was happy. I was glowing. It's like, who says pregnancy is hard? This is great. I could do this four times. <laughs> um, after he was born, it was a little rough because I didn't expect he was colicky. So he cried all the time. It's like, you know, that bouncy move. <laughs> yep. yep. My, my, my quads were very strong. But as I started speaking to women and just asking their advice and guidance, because it's, I felt it's almost like a private club. Until you have a baby, you're, you're not yeah. invited into it. Yeah. And all of a sudden, women started speaking about their experiences. Yeah. Um, some were beautiful, some were very dark. And the, uh, the postpartum depression, some felt that, I had one woman who felt that she never had that instant connection with the baby. Like it's almost like the baby didn't belong to her. And that was also part of postpartum, but it, just hearing all these different stories, I thought, my goodness, not everybody has the same glorious pregnancy. Yeah. And I spoke to a couple who had stillborns late in the game, um, who had miscarriages early on, who just kept trying and trying and trying and just couldn't have a baby. And I felt these stories need to be told. It was this yearning, this, it, it, I can't even explain it. It's like this brewing inside. And I remember walking literally from my house, we lived on 110th Street in Manhattan, to Costco on 116th with my husband and telling him, I really need to write this. I don't know how, I need to write this. Mm -hmm. But then it brings me back to when I was at ART, mm -hmm. our, senior thesis was with um, a mendacity with KJ Sanchez and it was all based on interviews, kind of like a la civilians theater. Yeah. And I thought that's, that's where I'm getting my material. I have to interview these women. So I interviewed so many women, including my mother, my mother-in-law. And I have like, I have enough interviews to write a book. You should, by the way. Thank you. And um, when I moved here to Atlanta, I didn't have an artistic outlet yet. You know, my daughter was six months old. My son was two and a half. I was stuck inside the house. And at night I was just kind of putting things together and interviewing. And there was a festival in New York called the One Festival, the monologue festival. Um, it's like a monologue festival, one woman show festival. And I worked with the woman before at La Tea Theater. Her name is Ver Veronica Caicedo. And mm -hmm. she'll say, submit, I said, it's really raw. I don't know, it's, you know, mm. And finally, I just threw everything out there. I said, listen, you have grammatical mistakes up the wazoo. Like, I'm just giving you the material. Yep. Let it be. She writes back and she goes, you've been accepted into the festival and now make it a show. Exactly. And it's like, how do I do that? So I called a friend of mine who's a playwright in New York, Carmen Rivera, and she's like, you need a dramaturge. Um, get yourself a dramaturge. So who do I get in it? Like, I don't know anyone in Atlanta. In New York, it would have been like so easy. Yeah. And that same week I had an interview with AMT, um, Atlanta Models and Talent. And you know, they always ask that, so what are you doing now? Question. Yeah. And yeah. I said, oh, you just accepted into a festival for theater. And the head of AMT at that point said, you know, hold on, I want you to meet one of our agents. She actually um, is a director for theater, okay. Susan, uh, Susan Reed. And she brings her out and I'm talking to her and I said, yes, I have this, I'm in the festival, I'm looking for a director and possibly a dramaturg. She's like, send this stuff over, I'll read it. Sure, send it to her. She says, I want to direct it, I have to direct this. And I have a dramaturg for you. And she brought in Jane Barnett and together we went through everything. And she said, some of these interviews could be their own show. Yeah. Completely, and so she helped me kind of distill all the material and, and create a storyline. So we did the festival, I won the festival, 
Yep. They put it up again at Teatro Circolo, which then gave us more time to rework the script. And then through Teatro Circolo, um, with Judy Bowman casting in New York, she introduced me to the Kitchen Theater in Ithaca. And they were doing a one, uh, a one, a one man show, one man woman special montage. They had a whole season of that. And they brought me up there, which then again, we got to rework the show and the stories and the monologues. And after Ithaca, she went to sleep. And I was working on a couple of other theater projects here in Atlanta and films. And then um, Aurora Theater here in Atlanta, we spoke one day. I was rehearsing for another show and I'm laying there on the floor. And mm -hmm. one of the, uh, the producers comes up and he's like, so are you new here? Why haven't we heard from you? I was like, well, my first two years I spent touring my show. And it was just in conversation. Yeah. Send me the show. Sure. So I sent it to him and he calls me. He's like, we would love to produce you next summer. Um, it would be, you know, in there, they have a Latinx theater box that they basically um, designate for all the Latino shows so that they hit that market. Mm -hmm. And um, I had my Atlanta premiere last year and I was supposed to do it again this year because of high demand and they sold out so many tickets, but with COVID we couldn't, but, um, but we were able to rework her again. Now she's it's to the point where it's like, leave her alone. Yeah. <laughs> she's <laughs> um, so it, I've been very blessed with mommy and, and it's a little, um, you know, I put myself in a very vulnerable situation because I'm talking about my personal experiences because I'm the through line of the story yep. with these interviews and these women playing different characters. So, you, you know, as my husband says, you just put our entire life on blast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, sorry. Yeah, but that's that's what makes it real, and that's what makes it uh, you know be connected. Um, I you know we had our our miscarriage you know between the first and the, and second child. Mm -hmm. We had a miscarriage I think at 16 weeks. Uh, wow. Where I remember getting a call you know at work for my wife saying, "Hey, I'm driving to the hospital right now. I'm about to have uh, have surgery. We had a miscarriage," and I just remember. You know, running into my boss's office saying i'm gone i need to run and running to the hospital and then it was a you know complex uh, procedure where they had to call in a separate doctor they didn't know at that moment where you know if my wife uh, was going to make it because if anything went wrong done and just you know sitting there going through it and then leaving the hospital and seeing all of the parents leaving the hospital with babies i remember just having a huge kind of uh, burden and uh, and carrying that pain until we had the uh, our second you know healthy uh, child uh, and that pain kind of uh, gone away so and what I remember my wife kind of um, uh, bringing up is that you know when she's talking to uh, to women uh, around her you never know what's happening in people's lives but once you open up and you say what happened in yours all of a sudden you realize that you know, she had a miscarriage and she had a miscarriage. This person had this happen to them. And then this community uh, really opens up and becomes a part of who you are. And I'm so happy that you did yours because it it needs to be out there. It needs to be helping people because a lot of people don't talk about it and they don't want to share it and they can't go to that vulnerable place. You did it. I'm sure it helped so many people just by watching. Uh, it. it it definitely did. I, I I met a lot of women after the show who who thanked me, um, because they didn't they didn't have the means to express themselves. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, there were some very heartbreaking moments, but I think we need the platform to speak and be okay with it. Yeah. And I mean, as the Russians taught me, theater is a reflection of society and. You know, yeah. it's just that platform for healing. Yeah, um, and it's a reflection of self, and it's a <clears throat> it's a continuation of looking at yourself mm -hmm. uh, and uh, discovering yourself. And I had to utilize every technique possible, including all of my spiritual practices and everything else, just to kind of let all of that go and and be the happy, positive person that I normally am. So it's. Yeah, we, we need it. Please continue with it. Please write that book. I, I, I think I think it's uh, it's necessary for so many uh, people out there. Um, and I'm sorry but, for your loss. 
Thank you. It's you know now now it's uh, it's kind of uh, you know it's been so long ago. It's fine. It's okay. You know we have a almost 16 year old daughter and we have an 11 year old son. So it's been long long ago. We processed all of it, but you know even now, uh, kind of as I bring that up and uh, these emotions uh, rush back, you see that yeah, not not mm-hmm. everything has been. Uh, has been uh, flushed out of your system and you're still feeling that uh, that hurt and probably will for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, how was your second pregnancy? You said you had a glorious first one. How did the second one go? I was put on bed rest. Oh my goodness. So it, yeah. It was her, her pregnancy was scary, which I discussed also in the play, but we just married it as one. So it flows. Yeah. Uh, with Julia, I had bleeding. So it was one of those moments where she could go or stay. And we were rushed to the hospital. They put me on bed rest. Um, It was, she was scary. Uh, It was also painful. I was sick the whole time. I was vomiting the whole time. Like it was a very different pregnancy. Um, Had I had that pregnancy first, I probably would have stayed with one child. Um, Because my, my emotions were so like, in an uproar like i felt like i was constantly negotiating it's like you're gonna be okay we can do this like it it was a very difficult pregnancy and i'm blessed that she came yeah um but on the other hand was she colicky when she came or she was different uh uh, after Mm -hmm. she was she wasn't colicky but you couldn't put her down (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) the children are completely different right i have i have a girl i have a boy you know Completely different pregnancies, completely different deliveries, completely different uh, children uh, in in how they were, and you know, just the terrible twos were very different as well. It just you have no idea, and one experience has no reflection on the other. And um, you know, same thing for you, obviously. So yeah, I carry that. She would lived on my that baby Bajorn. Yep. She was there until she was probably about two years old, and finally, it's like, girl, I can't. <laughs> You're too heavy. <laughs> Listen, you, you've uh, you've had uh, you have a lot of exercise, uh, you know, with the first one. You had a lot of exercise with the second one. You know, who needs workout? This is this is the you know mommy workout for you. Exactly. Perfect. All right, let's let's transition back to uh, to uh, to acting. And uh, again, you've done a ton of stage, but you you uh, continue to kind of do stuff on screen. And then um, lately, the last couple of years, it seems like you've been doing a lot more uh, screen. Has that been intentional or it just kind of worked out that way? Um, I would say kind of intentional okay. just because my children are tiny and yeah. they're, they're this little for so long. Yeah. And when you do theater, it's a lot of time commitment. I mean, it's okay. a huge time commitment. Uh, and then the eight o'clock curtains means I'm missing bedtime. So I only do one theater production a year where I allow myself that um, okay. just because I want to be present, Alan. Like, mm. I only have, what, my son just turned nine, so I have mm. maybe like nine more years before he goes to college, and then my daughter just turned seven. Yeah. And so it's fleeting. So it was more of a selfish decision. The theater's going to be there. It's something that I learned with age. Mm. You know, it's like, it's okay. This is my career. Yeah. They're going to need a grandma <laughs> at one point. <laughs> No, it, it's it's great, uh, and you you had some really memorable scenes. Uh, I, I love your scene in uh, my goodness, now it escapes me. Um, in Good Girls, yeah, oh, yeah. I love your scene. And just from a pure acting perspective, you know, you're playing you're playing a cop, and you're playing a cop who has to, in essence, act as something else in it in order to create kind of that uh, that lesson for another character in it. So from an acting perspective, how was it kind of to have multiple layers? You're acting in a role and then that character is acting in her role. What was that like? I loved it. I yeah. loved every minute of it. Um, again, you draw from personal experience, right? right. So I grew up with cops. My, okay. my brothers were on the force and I remember them having those conversations yeah. with me. And um, I remember even in high school, one of our enrichment days was, let's take you to the jail to see what it looks like. (laughs) So those were those personal reflections when you're doing your analysis. But it was just you in the given circumstances. 
Yeah. And you know, what if you said, hey, Lorraine, I need you to talk to my girl. She's acting up. Yeah. Then it's okay, no problem. You want me to scare the shit out of her? We'll do. Yeah. And so that's how it just felt. It just, and playing with Retta is wonderful. I mean, yeah. she's so generous and so wonderful to play with. And it was easy. She made it easy and the little girl was so cute. It's, it was fun. That scene was so much fun to play. I yeah. can't even begin to tell you. <laughs> How many takes uh, and uh, were the takes uh, different? Did you get a chance to improv uh, during it? No, they were very specific on lines. Okay. Very specific. Like they changed the lines twice because they, the writer wanted to hear it different. Okay. And then they reverted back to what was originally written. Like there was, you, you could not improvise. They, no. <laughs> Got it. And then uh, takes wise, uh, lots of takes or? Uh, a of takes, um, more, I remember more in the, in the corridor because of the walking and the pacing, because we had a camera on the floor, camera on top. So it was more technical. Okay. Um, how we get the beats to turn around so that when I turn, you actually see me and I see the little girl. So it was, it was more of a technical challenge. We did more takes in the jail cell because of the, the bars, the angle, the lights, yeah. and then, you know, trying to speak to someone with a camera in front of your face to speak. Yeah. Yep. It's experience. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a, it's a weird thing. And you know, we call it the magic of, of cinema, but um, it it's, it's like, wow. And then when I saw the edited version, it's like, so it worked. I connected. Yes. I was so concerned that I couldn't connect because there's this thing in front of me. Yeah. You're not, you're not getting the reaction. You're not looking into somebody's eyes. You're, you're not seeing anything. You're basically inventing, you know, uh, you know, I'm talking to camera now because the, of, of kind of uh, our, you know, uh, mm -hmm. setup, but it's, it's different. I want to look at you. I want to, uh, to get, uh, you know, your expressions. I want to be influenced by it and I can't do any of it because I have to look at the camera. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. And, uh, when that coverage is done on you, the camera is right here. Like, what? Okay. <laughs> it's, it's cool. Um, tell me about Sopranos. Oh my goodness. That was my first heartbreak. Oh, what a heartbreak. It was my first booking outside of grad school. So okay. it was very exciting and I booked it with the flu. Yeah, I don't say go go to auditions with the flu, but it, you know, I didn't shake anybody's hands. I just went in, I did it, it was the nurse, and I booked it off the first tape, so I never had a callback. Okay. Um, my agents called me, and they're like, did they call you for a callback? I was with Nicolosi at the time in New York. And I yeah. said, no, uh, they're like, well, you booked it. It's like, great, so I get on set, James Galdafini's there, Eddie Falco's there, who's sweet, oh my gosh. I was knitting, and she's like, oh, do you, try this stitch. And so it was a very nice experience. It was the first time I experienced having a handler. So there was a PA with me the whole time. And it's like, it's okay, I'm okay, really. She's like, no, I can't lose you. It's mm -hmm. like, okay. So, you know, coming out of grad school and being on a first SAG set was amazing. Um, I was playing the nurse so that when AJ, you know, is in the hospital and he tried to commit suicide and there's another girl there, um, his parents come in and they speak to Lorraine Brocco, who's a doctor there, and I'm the one telling him, hey, AJ, your parents are here. Yeah. So it was very exciting, I did it. I was so like walking on air. It's like my father watches The Sopranos. Yes, this means I have succeeded in his eyes. Yeah. My best friend throws, my best friend is on my favorite TV show party for me, a okay. screening party, and we're all there sitting, watching, watching, watching. And I see that Lorraine Bracco scene doesn't come up. And I looked at my, my husband then, was my boyfriend, and I said, they cut my scene. He goes, how do you know? I said, because I came right after her in the script. And he was really? I was like, they cut my scene. Yeah. Alan, it took me everything in my power not to cry. I sat there and it was just like, oh my God, this is horrible. And my, uh, my best friend's father-in-law comes up to me, he goes, are you sure you really filmed that? So then he was challenging, like, and it's like, yes, I did. I did. I can show you, like, my booking. I can show you, like, I took pictures yeah. of my script. Like, this was before, like, you know, true social media. I think Facebook just started coming out. Um, and it was my first heartbreak and my first lesson. And I called my agent, and he's like, who cares? You got paid. It's like, I uh, can't. Yeah. My real no one's yeah. going to believe me. And I was trying to get the footage and trying to get it. 
yeah, that was my first heartbreak. It was a lot of fun. James Galdafini, may he rest in peace, was a very big man. I mean, he walked into the room and it's like, oh, commanded it. Eddie Falco was sweet. I, the actor who played AJ, I forgot his name. Um, very nice as well. We shared a van together to go to set and back. So it felt very much like hanging out mm. and, and being there and learning. I did learn, again, it was my first time on a professional set. So I learned how fast they go and they don't, you say your line, say it the way you did at the audition. Like there's no need for you to reinvent how you say it. It's like, no, 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 just throw it away. Do what you did because that's why you got hired. Yeah. Um, so that was a lesson where it's like, I want to be fabulous for you. It's like, no, you're just, you're just a puzzle to the piece. Like <laughs> this is not your story. Yep. Yeah, it's it's a it's a weird thing that we all have to learn uh, during auditions, and then after we get on set, of hey, you have these lines, say them, you know, play the part, play the uh, profession. That's what we like. You're really just you know this this much, um, and we want to show the whole range. We want to show everything. Hey, I can do this, and I can do this, and this is just my first step. And once I get here, then I can get to real like really meaty co-stars and then i can get to guest stars I, you know i can really be on your show as a regular no they don't care about any of that just no your part uh, and you know we, we don't <laughs> want to waste more time yeah it's so funny that happened on legacies i remember one of the actors that i was working with he's like you think we'll make it on i was like i i don't know he's like you think they'll call us back again for the second one I said, I'm not sure. We're his foster parents. I mean, it could go either way. Either they can kill us off in the script or and not even need to see us. We can come back and then they kill us off. Like, there's so many ways we can go with this. And he had the chutzpah to ask the writers there. And I was sitting in the corner going, oh, Dude. Ask, that's going to be suicide. Yeah. <laughs> what did the writers say? No, he just asked. He's like, hey, what do you think of the possibilities of us coming back? They're like, we don't know. Yeah. And it's like, oh, okay. And we ended up coming back, but it was one of those where I'm going, that is artistic suicide. Don't ever put them on the spot like that. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you don't want to be the problem child. You want to be the one who does, uh, who does what they ask you to do, does it with a smile, and not create problems for anybody. Exactly. That's my motto. Yeah, perfect. Um, so what, again, I, we, we talked about your model now, uh, motto, excuse me now. Uh, what is your acting approach? Because you've had a lot of training and you've had training from all over the world in a lot of different methodologies what do you find that works for you what's your acting approach well i have what i call my toolbox okay right we all have our toolbox and i approach each each project differently because sometimes not all the projects need everything like the one-liner um yeah. i still do obviously my objectives what is it that I want? Like, I, I need to know what I want um, and how do I get there? Mm -hmm. So that's like my number one. But um, for me, I, what works for me is that I always create like a biography, even if it's a one liner. Where am I coming from? Who am I? What am I doing? Why am I here? Why do I have this job? Why is this important to me? What All of that, just so that I have some more backstory to the character mm -hmm. and I add, um, something I learned from one of the, uh, one of my coaches, a secret that you don't know, that I know. Yep. And it makes it so much more fun. It's, yeah. you know, so I add that. Um, lately, you know, when I start playing with different things and different techniques, like now I, uh, I just finished an acting, um, kind of like a 2% method booking class to teach me how to self tape at home. Sure. Um, sure. because now I can't go to my person anymore because of COVID. Um, yeah. And she has been teaching me to pick the environment first. Like, what is the environment before choosing anything else? And I'm working on that. But I find, like, when you start working on a new a new item and acting a new, it, it, everything gets wonky. Yep. So it's just like, okay. So, so now I'm working with, like, what's the environment like? How do you act in the environment? You know, the way we're talking and versus the way I talk to my husband or, the, you know, my children. There's, mm -hmm. there's a difference. Um, but for me, it's always kind of, it always goes back to Stanislavski, you in the given circumstances mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll delve in depending where the scene is. Like I take a little bit of you Meisner and I'll take a little bit of you Adler <laughs> and my own little ingredients and then whatever. And I like to, um, improv my scenes a lot. 
So I, I like to be, and I guess that's a little bit of Scott Ziegler, practical aesthetics, like the popcorn test. Like this is what the scene's about. If you're at a movie theater and you come in and say, what's happening? I can give you one sentence the scene. Or I like to make it like a tidbit of gossip. So it's like, Alan, did you know? <laughs> so I have all, I talk to myself a lot. It's good. Uh, yeah. It, and it gets you, it gets you in the proper energy and it gets you in the proper uh, kind of dynamics of the scene. And then you can just say the lines, but you're already in it. It's, it's grounding. I like it. Thank you. Very cool. Um, and uh, let's, uh, let's, again, you've mentioned uh, producing. <clears throat> do you still, uh, do you still produce? Is this something that you want to continue doing? Um, no, not really. I, mm-hmm. I, I did it and I was blessed because I did it with a salary. Like mm-hmm. I wasn't out to look for money. I was mm-hmm. out mainly to, to help hire the line producers and everybody else. And just, I'm very good at getting people together. Yeah. It's like, oh, you should meet this one and so-and-so. Um, mm-hmm. And very good at the organizational aspect of it, the paperwork, getting everybody to sign things. Hence why probably my mom thought I should be an attorney. Sure. <laughs> and, and I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that as a survival job because I was still there. For producing, it has to be something for me that now it's my chips in the game, mm-hmm. not playing with your chips. Right. Like I, it has to be me producing something that I'm going to love and it's going to ca- catapult me somewhere. Not just me elevating you, which is great, but I've been doing that for the last, you know, 30 years in a sense, right. <laughs> elevating somebody, even since I was little. It's like, Alan, I can help you in this school play. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but uh, for producing right now, the last thing I produced was my one woman show at the Aurora. I co-produced it with them. So again, it, it has to be something that's true to my heart and I'm not playing with someone else's poker chips. Makes sense. Well, that's, that's fair. Um, Last question before we get into our lightning round, uh, the actors' lightning round. <clears throat> if uh, I mean your kids are are, are young, <clears throat> but if they express interest in uh, in being a part of this world, uh, are you up for it? Would you advise them against it? I actually had them both uh, with Abrams Artists in New York in the kitty department. Okay. <laughs> we were babies, so I did the whole babies are us round, bye bye baby commercial stuff with them, and. Mm-hmm. Um, the last audition my son had before we moved here, the uh, the director told me, he was like, he doesn't like it because he kept walking from the set to behind the camera and asking him like, why, why do you do this? What's this? What? He goes, you have a future director in your hands, a future camera guy, or like, he's like, you not the acting. And right. Julia, when she was little, she was just too temperamental. Like it was just, you may get her in there, she'll be good or she may cry. Um, yeah. Now I think, just from ob- observing, I think she has more of a knack for it, just because she'll come up, like she's been watching a Netflix show called The Investigators, okay. and it's so cute. I mean, it's I'm, I'm a bit of a stickler when it comes to TV and what they can watch, so if we're watching mind-numbing stuff, you're only allowed a half an hour, but if you're learning something, we can do it. Um, okay. And so she came out the other day and she started talking to me in a British accent. It's like, Julian, mama, what? (laughs) Where's this coming from? And she'll just come and sing and song and dance and musical theater. So I wouldn't be surprised if she delves into that. My son is also very witty, but he's, he'll be your your, your set designer, your crew guy. Like he's building things, he's making stuff, he's, asking us to cut wood down for him to build like little huts. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wouldn't be against it. For me, Alan, it's whatever makes you happy. You know, I will do the same thing that my mom did is like, you do have to graduate from college. Like this is a no brainer. And mm-hmm. you do have to have a, a trade because you have to survive. It's, it's okay to have the arts and make that your career, but I don't want it to be to the point where you're suffering for your career because you don't have to suffer. Um, so I like, I kind of like the fact that my mom pushed me in that direction because it made me well-rounded to the point that, you know, I could work in an office. I can work, even though I'll stab myself with a fork in the eye in a fork in the office, but <laughs> because it's so boring, but I can do it if need be. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I told him, I was like, if you, whatever you love to do, you can do it. And that's what I always tell him. I was like, never say you can't. Mm-hmm. I said, you fail when you didn't try. Mm-hmm. 
that that's what I, I beat into them all the time. It's like, no, 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 no. They're, they're probably tired of hearing me. Yeah. Uh, it's same. Absolutely. Uh, I it, When I hear I can't, it's usually my brain is turned off. I'm not interested in doing it. No, nope, you can't. Um, so we're, we're working on it. It's with varying levels of successes, but <clears throat> hopefully over the years, it'll, it'll permeate enough uh, for them to, uh, to remember what it's needed. All right. We're at the uh, actor's lightning round. So um, uh, short questions, kind of shorter answers. You've been on a ton of projects, uh, you know, uh, some in different parts of the world. So what's your very favorite one that you've been on? Oh, my goodness. Very favorite one. Alan, yep. you're killing me. I feel I like there's a little bit of each of them that I loved. Okay. Um, in Moscow, I loved the uh, the Dostoevsky, the Night of Dostoevsky, because they they put me in roles that I would never be cast in. I have to say Chekhov at Columbia, mm -hmm. um, because I was cast as Arena, and again, no one would cast me as Arena, um, and the material was so dense and so heightened to get your hands around it was so meaty. Um, I really enjoyed, I mean, wow, this is hard. It's like there's there's something of every, like I feel like there's something in each and every one. The vagina monologues, I have to say, was one of my favorites. Okay. Um, because I, my part was something I would have never done in my life. Uh -huh. um, and to execute that on stage, with my mother in the audience. <laughs> um, but I also love the topic. I love the fact that, you know, let's talk about this. Yeah. Um, so I guess those were, were a couple of them. I liked Melancholy a lot. Um, we did that at ART. Um, it pushed me. Scott Ziegler was the director, so it pushed my limits. I had to be a total Jersey girl, get the dialect down, do the whole thing, and then we had to sing. I don't mm -hmm. sing, Alan, but as the Russians told me, never decide what the director wants. Right. So just kind of preface it with, you may not like it, but I'll do it. <laughs> Very good. So, yeah. uh, all right. What's the weirdest thing that ever happened to you on a set? I fell asleep. Really? How and where? Um, well, this was more in a theater production. We were rehearsing Melancholy, and my part was to disappear because I turn into a walnut, okay. right? And so I'm behind the stage and they put a bed there for me to lay down until my part came. And my part came and I didn't come out. Yep. <laughs> so that was one of the weirdest things that happened to me on set. Um, okay. Well, not on set, on stage. Um, on set, nothing really. I'm. Okay. I've been pretty, I mean, on what would you do? I lost my lavalier in between my body. Yeah. That was, so that was interesting because it's like the guys are talking to me in the ear and it's like, and I'm trying to signal with the cameras around, like, I don't have a lavalier. They're like, we can't hear you. It's like, I don't know where it went. <laughs> okay. Um, who's the best actor that you ever got to work with? in terms of pure acting stuff, not you know the most recognizable necessarily. Mm. There was a couple. Um, wow. I would say when I did Melancholy with Tamara Hickey, yeah. um, watching her perform on stage as an audience member always captivated me, but being on stage with her, I was in awe mm -hmm. um, that I got to work with. Um, when I did, oh, let me see, Bicycle Country mm -hmm. um, by Nilo Cruz, I did it, and Frank, I acted with Frank. Solorzano, who was my director. So he, it was myself, him, and Lucas. I enjoyed both of them greatly and watching their process and being with them on stage. And they were so, so generous, so generous and so giving. And it's like, even when their back was turned, 
you felt that they were there. It wasn't like my back turned, I'm not talking to you, Alan, so I'm not really here. You talk. It was like, my back is turned, but I have you. And so him and Lucas and watching that, Luca, this is name, Luca, not Lucas, sorry. Um, Luca, it was so, so gratifying in a selfish way, um, but also seeing their process. And then they were so grounded. And so then, you know, when you have all that energy bubbling and then you have like these grounded individuals who are there and they're like, I have you. And even if you, you know, you want to be in an ensemble where you lose a line and your partner has you. And that's how it felt like we always had each other. And so for me, that was like the dream team of sorts. That's awesome. I love that. What series or film out there right now you wish you were cast in? Oh my gosh, there was so many. You know, I never got on Law and Order. That is like an ego thing for me. I okay. auditioned for them, went to producers. I can't tell you how many times. Like, I knew Chelsea Pierce casting, like that whole area. I, that for me was one of my little moments where it's like, I would love to just do one scene. Like, I'll die. <laughs> So that was one just because Law and Order was there. I watched it as a child. Yeah. Around forever. Um, now, I love um, Blue Bloods. Blue mm -hmm. Bloods. Yep. Yeah, um, I know I would never do this, and the show's already over, but Game of Thrones. I was a Game of Thrones junkie. Okay. It, that, like those are the, you know when you have like what are your dream picks it's like that would have been fabulous um i know that one's not out now but you know we still watch the reruns <laughs> yeah um it's, it's me with the west wing you know the the show that's not on that i wish so wish that i was on um when when it was happening it's my favorite show tv drama ever uh, yeah. everybody who's watching uh, this knows they're like yeah 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 stop talking about it. Um, there, there, there's, there's a few. I have to like sit down and narrow it down. It's like, yeah. where you want to be. Um, did you ever see Newsroom? Oh, that's that's my five. That's number five on my list. Uh, I love the Newsroom. I am so sad that it was only uh, on for three seasons. I, I believe that's it. the writing was so prevalent. Everything. It's I broke my heart when they stopped it. I told my husband, I was like, you see. They always take this stuff with the good writing off. I mean, Aaron, Aaron is a genius. Aaron Sorkin, mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, you know, the West Wing, the newsroom. He's just, I, I, I'm, I resonate with that type of intelligent writing. And mm -hmm. I like shows that are incredibly intelligent, that I don't have to worry about somebody being killed at any moment. So there, there are a ton of shows that are amazing, but they give me PTSD after I watch them for a long enough where you know that's why the west wing billions you know newsroom suits these are the shows that are really really good in terms of dialogue in terms of people that you care about uh and i don't have to i can just sit there and enjoy it without having to worry about somebody dying any moment so it's uh it's that that's my kind of uh dramatic show so i love newsroom uh jeff daniels i mean oh my god oh. Awesome. That if that was still on the air, that would be the one that I think I would do the self-submitting to, whether my agents get mad or not. It's like the letters, like hi, hi. <laughs> yeah. uh, Tom Sadolsky. Uh, I um, it's just I, I I've seen him on uh, Life in Pieces, and I love him. But you know, after watching him on Newsroom, and you see just how much you know he has to offer as an actor. And then watching Life in Pieces, which is awesome. Uh, it's so much fun, and it was a great show. But I'm like, give him something meaty. He can do so much more. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. What's uh, what's one thing that most people do not know about you? Most people do not know about me. Um, I love gardening. Okay. Like I talk to my plants. They have names, yeah. and I stress bake. So instead of stress eat, I bake. I, I make bread, I make cake, I, I, yeah. It's like if I can go to school to become a chef, I would. <laughs> hey, you, you never know. Again, nothing, nothing, uh, nothing is closed at this point. Uh, 
well. That's a weird thing to say in COVID times. Nothing is closed in terms of a you know, oh, lifetime exactly. left to live and you can continue doing it. All right, I'll, I'll amend that statement. Um, so you stress bake, but who eats it afterwards? Is that, is that stress baking and then stress eating afterwards or just stress baking and then stop there? I have a little bit, but the family will eat it. I give to my neighbors all the time. Like I'm okay. constantly giving food out to everyone. It's like, they, they joke, they're like, are we stressed? It's like, yeah, you know, just. <laughs> it's also both the gardening and I feel cooking and baking are creative outlets. Yeah. So in times of COVID, we can't be as creative as we want. And it's not like I have a quiet house where I can sit down and write. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really do, you know, we have, I have to entertain two little kids mm -hmm. and a house full of people. And so it's just one of those things where you're like, okay, so I can get it out with my plants and gardening. And I have my first cucumber coming out for the season. Mm -hmm. and, and then when I cook and I bake and just watching you enjoy the food makes me happy. I don't know if that makes sense. It, it does, absolutely. But then what worries me a little bit is that if you talk to your plants and you're so, you know, so uh, happy about the first cucumber coming out, at what point do you take the cucumber and eat it? Do you feel bad during it? Do you, how does that work? No, I prefer to eat it before my animals outside eat it. Like, okay. <laughs> I, I, we have a fig tree and I've taken the figs before they ripe just so the deers don't get to it before I do. Yep. <laughs> Not yeah. very nice of, my, of me. <laughs> We have the same thing with cherries in our backyard. We have a cherry tree, and oh, if we don't yeah. get to it, it's it's done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very cool. All right, last uh, last question in the lightning round. Um, if there is one thing that you could change about yourself, what would it be? To be a little less militant and more spontaneous. Okay. That, yeah, I'm very like, it, it has to be in order. It has to be rigid. The dishes have to be put away this way. But like, it, there, there's an order that has to be, that has to be. Like, I can't sit down and talk to you until the whole house is clean. And it's like, and now I can speak. You got you. I guess maybe letting it go. <laughs> yeah. Um, as a parent, um, I, it, yeah, it seems like you're, if you're in the same boat. I'm not sure if we can. Uh, I don't think it's possible. So it's just a matter of us uh, trying to do as best as we can, because if you are that type of personality, which I am, you, you can't you can turn it off. You want things to be done. They're not done. It drives you crazy. And then you're making yourself you're screaming at the kids about it. It's, it's a cycle. <laughs> my son is like, I'm trying my best. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> And that phrase alone, because I hear it all the time too, that phrase alone really pisses me off because <laughs> I know they're not trying their best. I know for sure they're not trying their best. And yeah, so that's that's a whole separate conversation and probably another book that uh, that you and I can write together. Exactly. Uh, all right. So last question for you. Um, if you had a chance to go and talk to a young Lorraine uh, and uh, give her a bit of acting advice, what would that be? Live life. Okay. Completely. Um, and I'll give a disclaimer for that. When I was younger, I, I was hitting the pavement so much that I was missing birthdays and family events and all of this for non-paying gigs. Mm -hmm. I was an actor and I had to. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was like your eat, sleep, breathing, acting. So for a younger Lorraine, it would be like live life and be there for those moments mm -hmm. so that you can partake. And then it also makes everything much more richer, right? Um, in your acting. And don't put so much stock in what other people think about you. Those would be my two my two words of wisdom it's just like it's kind of like it's none of my business what you think about me i think wayne dyer says that dr wayne dyer yep. um still learning that alan i'm still working on that one <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of things that wayne says that you know i've been listening to for the past two decades and i'm still working on it uh, i love him I, my book is in tatters and i'm still like i can't get this lesson <laughs> It's a journey, like acting, it's a marathon. Uh, same thing with self-improvement, it's, it's a journey. 
exactly. Uh, and by the way, the um, uh, great advice, and great advice to young Lorraine, but um, I knew, again, the name Lorraine rang a bell somewhere deep uh, for me, but not until I asked you a question, if you can go back and tell a young Lorraine something where I'm like, immediately I went to Back to the Future because there's the Lorraine and you get a chance to talk to young Lorraine. I'm like, that's where it was coming from. I get it. I love her. Her name was Lorraine. <laughs> Yeah, my goodness. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't a very popular name in my generation. Uh, that's it's uh, yeah. Uh, I, I I can talk about uh, Lorraine and that movie because that movie was it was a part of my transition into uh, America. You know, I watched the first one, Back to the Future, now uh, in uh, Ukraine. In Ukraine, when again, no American movies were were aired there at that time, so it was on a you know VCR. You had to yeah. go to a place and they were playing it on VCR. Then I watched that and then I came to the US and the second one came out. So it was kind of that whole transition uh, part for me. I love that uh, that trilogy. It's it's always will be special in my heart. Oh. Um, Lorraine, thank you so much for coming on. It, it's, a, it's a fascinating conversation that uh, I, I'm glad that you allowed me to uh, to get a glimpse into uh, into your life and into your passion for acting. It's inspiring. I'm I'm gonna rewatch the interview uh, anytime that I need uh, a little boost of energy to go out and get uh, stuff done. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alan, for having me on. It was fun to play and talk. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, thanks to everybody for every thanks to everybody uh, for tuning in. And by the way, this is how we ruin takes people. Uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in, uh, and this is why we do, you know, mouth warm-ups and all sorts of exercises that I should have been doing before. Like the trails. Um, <laughs> yep. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being with us. Uh, please like, comment, share. We're going to post a lot of links uh, right below the video, so click on them. Check out Lorraine's uh, website. Follow her, and uh, next time she's doing something, please, please, please go and participate in it. Thanks again.